There we go. Why, hello everybody, and welcome. Yes, I realize. <laughs> yes. Um, did not realize the gain was set to negative 11. Okay. I will continue to mess with that. Well, there goes my fancy intro. You know, not like I needed anything fancy, right? Ha 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 ha. Okay. This should be good enough. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Halloween extravaganza at Cerulean Skies, or rather, near the tail end of it. It wouldn't be a Halloween extravaganza if I didn't read out spooky, scary stories for everybody. And so that's what we're here to do. Let me know, as over the course of my reading, how things generally sound in terms of the audio and stuff like that. Um, and of course, when it comes to these sorts of sessions, I will not be reading out stuff from the alert box if things show up. Um, as such, I actually am going to be muting... Oh, it's not even on here. Yeah. Um, well, actually, hold on. Yeah, I actually won't even keep it on just to keep the ambiance. So if things happen, definitely tell everyone we said thank you from here on Cerulean Skies. And yeah, hello everybody, hello. <clears throat> okay, so I have selected three short stories to read from the 20th century. Um, and yeah, let's just get started without, uh, without further ado. Do I need to turn the music, before I begin, do I need to turn the music up or down? Or, like, do you think we're all good with generally the music volume and stuff like that? Down a tad? I can do that. How about that? can also turn myself up a tiny bit. can do a little bit of this, too. Okay, how about now? Good? Okay. And I'll keep keep an eye on chat too as I go. So, the first short story that I will be reading is a short story known as Lamb to the Slaughter by Robert Dahl, written somewhere between 1960 and 1990, I think. I think it's closer to the 1916s and stuff like that. <clears throat> so without further ado, let us begin The Lamb to the Slaughter. I should turn you down a little bit more. The room was clean, warm and clean, the curtains drawn, the two table lamps alit hers and the one by the empty chair opposite. On the sideboard behind her, two tall glasses, soda water, whiskey, fresh ice cubes in the thermos bucket. Mary Maloney was waiting for her husband to come home from work. Now and again, she would glance up at the clock, but without anxiety, merely to please herself with the thought that each minute gone made it near the time when he would come. There was a slow, smiling air about her, and about everything she did. The drop of a head as she bent over her sewing was curiously tranquil. Her skin, for this was her sixth month with child, had acquired a wonderful translucent quality. The mouth was soft. And the eyes, with their new placid look, seemed larger, darker than before. When the clock said ten minutes to five, she began to listen, and a few moments later, punctually, as always, she heard the tires on the gravel outside, and the car door slamming, the footsteps passing the window, the key turning in the lock. She laid aside her sewing, stood up, and went forward to kiss him as he came in. Hello, darling, she said. Hello, darling, he answered. She took his coat and hung it in the closet. Then she walked over and made the drinks, a strongish one for him, a weak one for herself. And soon she was back again in her chair with the sewing, and he in the other, opposite, holding the tall glass with both hands, rocking it so the ice cubes tinkled against the side. For her... 
This was always a blissful time of day. She knew he didn't want to speak much until the first drink was finished, and she, on her side, was content to sit quietly, enjoying his company after the long hours alone in the house. She loved to luxuriate in the presence of this man, and the feel almost as a sunbather feels the sun that warm male glow that came out of him to her when they were alone together. She loved him for the way he sat loosely in a chair, for the way he came in a door or moved slowly across the room with long strides. She loved intent, far look in his eyes when they rested in her. For the way, oh, my bad. She loved him for the way he sat loosely in a chair, for the way when, for the way he came in a door or moved slowly across the room with long strides. She loved intent, far look in his eyes when they rested in her. The funny shape of the mouth and especially the way he remained silent about his tiredness, sitting still with himself until the whiskey had taken some of it away. Tired, darling? Yes, he said. I'm tired. And as he spoke, he did an unusual thing. He lifted his glass and drained it in one swallow, although there was still half of it, at least half of it left. She wasn't really watching him, but she knew what he had done because she had heard the ice cubes falling back against the bottom of the empty glass when he lowered his arm. He paused a moment, leaning forward in the chair. Then he got up and went slowly over to fetch himself another. I'll get it, she cried, jumping up. Sit down, he said. When he came back, she noticed that the new drink was dark amber with a quantity of whiskey in it. Darling, shall I get your slippers? No. She watched him as he began to sip the dark yellow drink, and she could see the oily, sw little oily swirls in the liquid because it was so strong. I think it's a shame, she said, that when a policeman gets to be as senior as you, they keep him walking about on his feet all day long. He didn't answer, so she bent her head again and went on with her sewing. But each time he lifted the drink to his lips, she heard the ice cubes clinking around the side of the glass. Darling, she said, would you like me to get you some cheese? I haven't made any supper because it's Thursday. No, he said. If you're too tired to eat out, she went on, it's still not too late. There's plenty of meat and stuff in the freezer, and you can have it right here and not even move out of the chair. Her eyes waited on him for an answer, a smile, a little nod, but he made no sign. Anyway, she went on, I'll get you some cheese and crackers first. I don't want it, he said. She moved uneasily in her chair, the large eyes still watching his face. But you must eat. I'll fix it anyway, and then you can have it or not, as you like. She stood up and placed her sewing on the table by the lamp. Sit down, he said. Just for a minute, sit down. It wasn't until then that she began to get frightened. Go on, he said. Sit down. She lowered herself back slowly into the chair, watching him all the time with those large, bewildered eyes. He had finished the second drink and was staring down into the glass frowning. Listen, he said, I've got something to tell you. What is it, darling? What's the matter? He had now become absolutely motionless, and he kept his head down so the light from the lamp beside him fell across the upper part of his face, leaving the chin and mouth in shadow. She noticed there was a little muscle moving near the corner of his left eye. This is going to be a bit of a shock to you, I'm afraid, he said. But I've thought about it a good deal, and I've decided the only thing to do is tell you right away. I hope you won't blame me too much. And he told her. It didn't take long. Four or five minutes at most. And she, sa and she sat very still through it all, 
watching him with a kind of dazed horror as he went further and further away from her with each word. So there it is, he added, and I know it's kind of a bad time to be telling you, but there, simply, but there simply wasn't any other way. Of course, I'll give you money and see that you're looked after, but there needn't really be any fuss. I hope not anyway. It wouldn't be very good for my job. Her first instinct was not to believe any of it, to reject it at all. It occurred to her that perhaps he hadn't even spoken, that she herself had imag imagined the whole thing. Maybe, if she went about her business and acted as though she hadn't been listening, then later, when she sort of woke up again, she might find none of it had happened at all. I'll get the supper, she managed to whisper, and this time, he didn't stop her. When she walked across the room, she couldn't feel her feet touching the floor. She couldn't feel anything at all, except a slight nausea and a desire to vomit. Everything was automatic now, down to the steps to the cellar, the light switch, the deep freeze, the hand inside the cabinet taking hold of the first object it met. She lifted it out and looked at it. It was wrapped in paper, so she took off the paper and looked at it again. A leg of lamb. All right then, they would have lamb for supper. She carried it upstairs, holding the thin bone end of it with her with both her hands, and she went through the living room. She saw him, and as she went through the living room, she saw him standing over by the window with his back to her, and she stopped. For God's sake, he said, hearing her, but not turning around. Don't make supper for me. I'm going out. At that point, Mary Maloney simply walked up behind him, and without any pause, she swung the big frozen leg of lamb in high in the air and brought it down as hard as she could on the back of his head. She might, as, she might just as well have hit him with a steel club. She stepped back a pace, waiting, and the funny thing was that he remained standing there for at least four or five seconds gently swaying. Then he crashed to the carpet. The violence of the crash, the noise, the small table overturning, helped bring her out of the shock. She came out slowly, feeling cold and surprised, and she stood for a while, blinking at the body, still holding the ridiculous piece of meat tight with both hands. All right, she told herself. So I've killed him. It was extraordinary, now, how clear her mind became all of a sudden. She began thinking very fast. As a wife of a detective, she knew quite well what the penalty would be. That was fine. It made no difference to her. In fact, it would be a relief. On the other hand, what about the child? What were the laws about murderers with unborn children? Did they kill the then both mother and child? Or did they wait until the tenth month? What did they do? She carried the meat into the kitchen, placed it in a pan, turned the oven on high, and shoved it inside. Then she washed her hands and ran upstairs to the bedroom. She sat down before the mirror, tidied her hair, touched up her lops and face. She tried to smile. It came out rather peculiar. And she tried again. Hello, Sam, she said brightly aloud. The voice sounded peculiar, too. I want some potatoes, please, Sam. Yes, and I think a can of peas. That was better. Both the smile and the voice were coming out better now. She rehearsed it several times more. Then she ran downstairs, took her coat, went out the back door, down the garden, and into the street. It wasn't six o'clock yet and the lights were still on in the grocery shop. Hello, Sam, she said brightly, smiling at the man behind the counter. Why, good evening, Mrs. Mallory. How are you? I want some potatoes, please, Sam. Uh, yes, and I think a can of peas. The man turned and reached up behind him on the shelf for the peas. Patrick's decided he's tired and doesn't want to eat out tonight, she told him. 
we usually go out Thursdays, you know. And now he's caught me without any vegetables in the house. Hmm, then how about meat, Mrs. Mal Maloney? No, I've got meat, thanks. I've got a nice leg of lamb from the freezer. Oh. I don't know. I don't much like cooking it frozen, Sam, but I'm taking a chance on it this time. You think it'll be all right? Personally, the grocer said, I don't believe it makes any difference. You want these Idaho potatoes? Oh, yes, that'll be fine. Two of these. Anything else? The grocer cocked his head on one side, looking at her pleasantly. How about afterwards? What are you going to give him for afterwards? The man... Uh, well, what would you suggest, Sam? The man glanced around his shop. How about a nice big slice of cheesecake? I know he likes that. Perfect, she said. He loves it. And when it was all wrapped and she had paid, she put on her brightest smile and said, Thank you, Sam. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Maloney, and thank you. And now, she told herself, as she hurried back, all she was doing now, she was returning home to her husband, and he was waiting for a supper, and she must cook it good and make it as tasty as possible, because the poor man was tired. And if, when she entered the house, she happened to find anything unusual, or tragic, or terrible, then naturally it would be a shock, and she'd become frantic with grief and horror. Mind you, she wasn't expecting to find anything. She was just going home with the vegetables. Mrs. Patrick Maloney was going home with the vegetables on Thursday evening to cook supper for her husband. That's the way, she told herself. Do everything right and natural. Keep things absolutely natural and there'll be no need for any acting at all. Therefore, when she entered the kitchen by the back door, she was humming a little tune to herself and smiling. Patrick, she called. How are you, darling? She put the parcel down on the table and went through into the living room. And when she saw him lying there on the floor with his legs doubled up and one arm twisted back underneath his body, it really was rather a shock. All the old love and longing for him welled up inside her, and she ran over to him, knelt down beside him, and began to cry her heart out. It was easy. No acting was necessary. A few minutes later, she got up and went to the phone. She knows the number of the police station, and when the man at the other end received, she cried to him, Quick! Come quick! Patrick's dead! Who's speaking? Mrs. Maloney. Mrs. Patrick Maloney. You mean, Patrick Maloney's dead? I think so, she sobbed. He's lying on the floor, and I think he's dead. Be right over, the man said. The car came very quickly, and when she opened the front door, two policemen walked in. She knew them both. She knew nearly all the men at the precinct, and she fell right into a chair, then went over to join the other one, who was called O'Malley, kneeling by the body. Is he dead? she cried. I'm afraid he is. What happened? Briefly, she told her story about going out to the grocer and coming back to find him on the floor. While she was talking, crying and talking, Noonan discovered a small patch of congealed blood on the dead man's head. He shouted to O'Malley, who got up at once and hurried to the phone. Soon, other men began to come into the house. First, a doctor, then two detectives, one of whom she knew by name. Later, a police photographer arrived and took pictures, and a man who knew about fingerprints. There was a great deal of whispering and muttering beside the corpse, and the detectives kept asking her a lot of questions. But they always treated her kindly. She told her story again, this time right from the beginning, when Patrick had come in. And she was sewing, and he was tired. So tired he hadn't wanted to go out for supper. She told how she'd put the meat in the oven, it's there now, cooking, and how she'd slopped out to the grocer for vegetables, 
and come back to find him lying on the floor. Which grocer? One of the detectives asked. She told him, and he turned and whispered something to the other detective, who immediately went outside into the street. In 15 minutes, he was back with a page of notes. And there was more whispering. And through her sobbing, she heard a few of the whispered phrases. Acted quite normal. Very cheerful. Wanted to give him a good supper. Peas. Cheesecake. Impossible that she... After a while, the photographer and the doctor departed and two other men came in and took the corpse away on a stretcher. Then the fingerprint man went away. The two detectives remained, and so did the two policemen. They were exceptionally nice to her, and Jack Noonan asked if she would rather go somewhere else. To her sister's house, perhaps. Or to his own wife, who would take care of her and put her up for the night. No, she said. She didn't feel she could move even a yard at the moment. Would they mind awfully of she, of, uh, if she stayed just where she was until she felt better? She didn't feel too good at the moment. She really didn't. They... Then hadn't she be better lying down in bed? Jack Noonan asked. No, she said. She'd like to stay right where she was, in this chair. A little later, perhaps, when she felt better she would move. So they left her there, while they went about their business searching the house. Occasionally, one of the detectives asked her another question. Sometimes Jack Noonan spoke at her gently as he passed by. Her husband, he told her, had been killed by a blow on the back of the head, administered with a heavy blunt instrument, almost certainly by a large piece of metal. They were looking for the weapon. The murderer may have taken it with him, but on the other hand, he may have thrown, thrown it away or hidden it, hidden it somewhere on the premises. It's the old story, he said. Get the weapon, and you've got the man. Later, one of the detectives came up and sat beside her. Did she know, he asked, of anything in the house that could have been used as the weapon? Would she mind having a look around to see if anything was missing? A very big spanner, for example, or a heavy metal vase. They didn't have any heavy metal vases, she said. Or a big spanner. She didn't think they had a big spanner, but there might be some things like that in the garage. The search went on. She knew... She knew that there were other policemen in the garden all around the house. She could hear their footsteps on the gravel outside, and sometimes she saw a flash of a torch through a chink in the curtains. It began to get late, nearly nine, and she noticed by the clock on the mantel. The four men searching the room seemed to be growing weary, a trifle exasperated. Jack, she said, the next tome, next time Sergeant Noonan went by, would you mind giving me a drink? Sure, I'll give you a drink. You mean this whiskey? Yes, please. But just a small one. It might make me feel better. He handed her the glass. Why don't you have one yourself? She said. You must be awfully tired. Please do. You've been very good to me. Well, he answered. It's not strictly allowed. But I might take just a drop to keep me going. One by one, the others came in and were persuaded to take a little snip of the whiskey. They stood around rather awkwardly with the drinks in their hands uncomfortable in her presence, trying to say consoling things to her. Sergeant Noonan wandered into the kitchen and came out quickly and said, Look, Mrs. Maloney, you know that oven of yours is still on and the meat's still inside. <gasps> oh, dear me, she cried. So it is. I better turn it off for you, hadn't I? Will you do that, Jack? Thank you so much. When the sergeant returned a second time, she looked at him with her rather large, dark, tearful eyes. Jack Noonan, she said. Yes? Would you do me a small favor, you and these others? We can try, Mrs. Maloney. Well, she said, here you all are, and good friends of dear Patrick's too, and helping to catch the man who killed him. You must be terribly hungry by now. 
because it's long past your supper time, and I know Patrick would never forgive me. God bless his soul, if I'm allowed you to remain in, in his house without offering you a decent hospitality. Why don't you eat up that lamb that's in the oven? It'll be cooked just right now. Wouldn't dream of it, Sergeant Noonan said. Please, she begged. Please eat it. Personally, I couldn't tough a thing. Certainly not what's been in the house when he was here. But it's all right for you. It'd be a favor to me if you'd eat it up. Then you can go on with your work again afterwards. There was a good deal of hesitating among the four policemen, but they were clearly hungry. And in the end, they were persuaded to go into the kitchen and help themselves. The woman stayed where she was, listening to them speaking among themselves. Their voices thick and sloppy because their mouths were, were full of meat. Have some more, Charlie. No, better not finish it. She wants us to finish it. She said so. Be doing her a favor. Uh, okay, then. Give me some more. That's the hell of a big club the gut must have used to hit poor Patrick, one of them was saying. The doc says his skull was smashed all to pieces, just like from a sledgehammer. That's why it ought to be easy to find. Exactly what I say. Whoever done it, they're not going to be carrying a thing like that around with them longer than they need. One of them belched. Personally, I think it's right here on the premises. Probably right under our very noses. What do you think, Jack? And in the other room, Mary Maloney began to giggle. The end. That one was quite a good one, I will say. Like, I, I like the, the twist that it did. And the fact that she began to cook the lamb that she used to kill her husband. And the fact that she then fed it to everybody else. Okay, let me see what everybody said in chat real quickly before I move on to the next story and hydrate a tiny bit. <laughs> we are, aren't we? This is, this is a good point, Joey, that we are just handing this out to people. Very well. The next one is known as The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. I will do my best to sound slightly European for this one, because I think it'll make it a little bit more silly. So, strap in everybody, get cozy, and let us begin the second story. White Golden. I'm trying my best. I don't want to offend anybody from Europe. I just want to add a little bit of European twang because it adds some flavor text to story reading like every audiobook reader ever. All right, enough silly talk. Let us begin the next story. The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. It's true. Yes, I have been ill, very ill. But why do you say that? I have lost control of my mind. Why do you say that I am mad? Can you not see that I have full control of my mind? Is it not clear that I am not mad? Indeed, the illness only made my mind, my feelings, my senses stronger, more powerful. Powerful. <clears throat> my sense of hearing especially became more powerful. I could hear sounds I had never heard before. I heard sounds from heaven, and I heard sounds from hell. Listen, listen, and I will tell you how it happened. You will see, you will hear how healthy my mind is. It is impossible to say how the idea first entered my head. There was no reason for what I did. I did not hate the old man. I even loved him. He had never hurt me. I did not want his money. I think it was his eye. His eye was like the eye of a vulture, the eye of one of those terrible birds that watch and wait while an animal dies, 
and then fall upon the dead body and pull it to pieces to eat. When the old man looked at me with his vulture eye, a cold feeling went up and down my back. Even my blood became cold. And so, I finally decided I had to kill the old man and close that eye forever. So you think that I am mad? A madman cannot plan, but you should have seen me. During all of that week, I was as friendly to the old man as I could be, and warm and loving. Every night about 12 o'clock, I slowly opened his door, and when the door was opened wide enough, I put, I, enough I put my hand in, and then my head. In my hand, I held a light covered over with a cloth so that no light showed, and I stood there quietly. Then, carefully, I lifted the cloth, just a little, so that a single, thin, small light fell across that eye. For seven nights I did this. Seven long nights. Every night, at midnight. Always the eye was closed, so it was impossible for me to do the work. For it was not the old man I felt I had to kill. It was the eye. His evil eye. And every morning I went to his room and with I went to his room and with a warm friendly voice I asked him how he had slept he could not guess that every night just at 12 I looked in at him as he slept The old man was lying there not dreaming that I was at his door suddenly he moved in his bed You may think I became afraid but no the darkness in his room was thick and black I knew he could not see the opening of the door. I continued to push the door, slowly, softly. I put it in my hand. I put in my head. I put in my hand with the covered light. Suddenly, the old man sat straight up in bed and cried, Who's there? I stood quite still. For a whole hour, I did not move, nor did I hear him lie again lie down in his bed. He just sat there, listening. Then I heard a sound, a low cry of fear which escaped from the old man. Now I knew that he was sitting up in his bed, filled with fear. I knew that he knew I was there. He did not see me there. He could not hear me there. He felt me there. Now he knew that death was standing there. Slowly, little by little, I lifted the cloth until a small, small light escaped under it to fall upon, to fall upon that vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and my anger increased as it looked straight at me. I could not see the old man's face, only that eye, that hard blue eye, and the blood in my body became like ice. Have I not told you that my hearing has become unusually strong? Now I could hear, hear a quick, low, soft sound, like the sound of a clock heard through a wall. It was the beating of the old man's heart. I tried to stand quietly, but the sound grew louder. The old man's fear must have been great indeed. And as the sound grew louder, my anger became greater and more painful. But it was more than anger. In the quiet night, in the dark silence of the bedroom, my anger became fear. For the heart was beating so loudly that I was sure someone must hear. The time had come. I rushed into the room, crying, Die! Die! The old man gave a loud cry of fear as I fell upon him and held the bedcovers tightly over his head. Still, his heart was beating, but I smiled as I felt that success was near. For many minutes, that heart continued to beat, but at last the beating stopped. There was no sound. Yes, he was dead. Dead as a stone. His eye would trouble me no more. So, I am mad, you say? You should have seen how careful I was to put the body where no one could find it. First I cut off the head, then the arms and the legs. I was careful not to let a single drop of blood 
fall on the floor. I pulled up three of the boards that formed the floor and put the pieces of the body there. Then I put the boards down again, carefully, so carefully that no human eye could see that they had been moved. As I finished this work, I heard that someone was at the door. It was now four o'clock in the morning, but still dark. I had no fear, however, as I went down to open the door. Three men were at the door, three officers of the police. One of the neighbors had heard the old man's cry and had called the police. These three had come to ask questions and to search the house. I asked the policemen to come in. The cry, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I said, was away. He had gone to visit a friend in the country. I took them through the whole house, telling them to search it all, to search well. I led them finally into the old man's bedroom, and as if playing a game with them, I asked them to sit down and talk for a while. <laughs> my easy, quiet manner made the policemen believe my story, so they sat talking with me in a friendly way. But although I answered them in the same way, I soon wished that they would go. My head hurt and there was a strange sound in my ears. I talked more and faster. The sound became clearer, and still they sat and talked. Suddenly, I knew that the sound was not in my ears. It was not just inside my head. At that moment, I was to become quite white. I talked still faster and louder, and the sound too became louder. It was a quick, low, soft sound, like the sound of a clock heard through a wall, a sound I knew well. Louder it became, and louder. Why did the men not go? Louder and louder. I stood up and walked quickly around the room. I pushed my chair across the floor to make more noise, to cover that terrible sound. I talked even louder. And still the man sat and talked and smiled. Was it possible that he could not hear, or that they could not hear? No, they heard. I was certain of it. They knew. Now it was they who were playing a game with me. I was suffering more than I could to bear from their smiles and from that sound. Louder, louder louder. Suddenly, I could bear it no longer. I pointed at the boards and cried, yes! Yes, I killed him! Pull up the boards and you shall see, I killed him. But why does his heart not stop beating? Why does it not stop? The End I hope my descent into insanity rang through as the story went on. It is an odd ending indeed. I believe the purpose of it is to convince the reader that, like, he hadn't committed the murder, but that he also did or something like that. It basically is just a crazy guy telling you that, no, no, I didn't do it, and then, you know, he actually did do it. <laughs> Funny enough. Well, now, hold on. I hear Cerulean Skies. I'm not promoting anything. Yet. I only promote the most wholesome and pure of things. There are others that can promote the impure side of things. Ha 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 ha. It is possible I might need a fourth story, but we shall see how this next one goes. I had only planned for three, so... Perhaps I can find a fourth. 
really quickly so that we can do a little bit more storytelling. And of course, my audience, if you have a story that you would like me to read, say for work, then I can possibly read it out as well. I do take suggestions. All right, we shall begin the final story. The final story is The Monkey's Paw by W.W. Jacobs, written in 1901. Just hydrating before I start. Everybody make sure we hydrate tonight. The night is still young, and there's plenty more to come still. Aha! Perhaps the gremlins will come out and give you a bit of a spook. Or perhaps the ghosts will come out and haunt you in your sleep. But without further ado, let us begin the next story. The Monkey's Paw. Without, the night was cold and wet. But in the small... Wee. But in the small parlor of Labernam Villa, the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. Father and son were at chess, the former who possessed ideas about the game involving radical changes, putting his king into such sharp and unnecessary perils that it even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placidly by the fire. Ah, oh, get the wind, said Mr. White, who, having seen a fatal mistake after it was too late, was amiably, amiably dis, uh, derious of preventing his son from seeing it. I'm listening, said the latter, grimly surveying the board as he stretched out his hand. Check. I should hardly think he'd come tonight, said his father with his hand poised over the board. Mate, replied the son. That's the worst of living so far out, bawled Mr. White, with sudden and unlooked for violence. Of all the beastly, slushy, out-of-the-way places to live in, this is the worst. Pathways a bog, and the roads a torrent. I don't know what people are thinking about. I suppose because only two houses in the road are let. They think it doesn't matter. Never mind, dear, said his wife, soothingly. Perhaps you'll win the next one. Mr. White looked up sharply, just in time to intercept a knowing glance between mother and son. The words died away on his lips, and he hid a guilty grin in his thin gray beard. There he is, said Herbert White, as the gate banged to loudly and heavy footsteps came toward the door. The old man rose with hospitable haste, and opening the door was heard condoling with the new arrival. The new arrival also condoled with himself, so that Mrs. White said tut tut and coughed gently as her husband entered the room, followed by a tall, burly man beady of eye and rubicund, and rubicund of visage. Sergeant Major Morris, he said, introducing himself. The Sergeant Major shook hands and taking the proffered seat by the fire, watched contently while his host got out his whiskey and tumblers and stood a small, and stood a small copper kettle on the fire. At the third glass, his eyes got brighter, and he began to talk. The little family circle regarding with eager interest this visitor from distant parts, as he squared his broad shoulders in the chair and spoke of wild scenes and doughty deeds, of wars and plagues and strange peoples. 
21 years of it, said Mr. White, nodding at his wife and son. When he went away, he was a slip of a youth in the warehouse. Now look at him. He don't look to have taken much harm, said Mrs. White, politely. I'd like to go to India myself, said the old man, just to look round a bit, you know? Better where you are, said the sergeant major, shaking his head. He put down the empty glass, and sighing softly, shook it again. I should like to see those old temples and fakirs and jugglers, said the old man. What was that you started telling me the other day about a monkey's paw or something, Morris? Uh, nothing, said the soldier, hastily. Least way is nothing worth hearing. Monkey's paw? said Mrs. White, curiously. Well, it's just a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps, said the sergeant major offhandedly. His three listeners leaned forward eagerly. The visitor absentmindedly put his empty glass to his lips and then set it down again. His host filled it for him. To look at, said the sergeant major, fumbling in his pocket. It's just an ordinary little paw, dried to a mummy. He took something out of his pocket and proffered it. Mrs. White drew back with a grimace, but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. And what is there special about it? inquired Mr. White as he took it from his son and having examined it, placed it upon the table. It had a, whole t it had a spell put on it by an old fakir said the sergeant major a very holy man he wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives and that those who interfered with it did it did so to their sorrow he put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it his manner was so impressive that his hearers were conscious that their light laughter jarred somewhat well well, why don't you have three, sir? Said Herbert White cleverly. The soldier regarded him in the way that middle age is wont to regard a presumptuous youth. I have, he said, quietly, and his blotchy face whitened. And did you really have the three wishes granted? Asked Mrs. White. I did, said the sergeant major, and his glass tapped against his strong teeth. And has anybody else wished? Persisted the old lady. The first man had his three wishes, yes, was the reply. I don't know what the first two were, but the, first, but the third was for death. That's how I got the paw. His tones were so grave that a hush fell upon the group. If you've had your three wishes... It's no good to you now then, Morris, said the old man at last. What do you keep it for? The soldier shook his head. Fancy, I suppose, he said slowly. I did have some idea of selling it, but I don't think I will. It has caused enough mischief already. Besides, people won't buy. They think it's a fairy tale, some of them, and those who do think anything of it want to try it first and pay me afterward. If you could have another three wishes, said the old man, eyeing him keenly, would you have them? I don't know, said the other. I don't know. He took the paw and dangling, dangling it between his forefinger and thumb, suddenly threw it upon the fire. White, with a slight cry, stooped down and snatched it off. Better let it burn, said the soldier, solemnly. Uh, if you don't want it, Morris, said the other, give it to me. I won't, said his friend doggedly. I threw it on the fire. If you keep it, don't blame me for what happens. Pitch it again on the fire again like a sensible man. The other shook his head and examined his new possession closely. How do you do it? He inquired. 
Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud, said the sergeant major. But I warn you of the consequences. Sounds like Arabian Nights, said Mrs. White. As she rose and began to set the supper. Don't you think you might wish for four pairs of hands for me? Her husband drew the talisman from the pocket, and then all three burst into laughter as the sergeant major, the look of alarm on his face, caught him by the arm. <laughs> if you must wish, he said gruffly, wish for something sensible. Mr. White dropped it in, back in his pocket, and placing chairs, mentioned his friend at the table. In the business of supper, the talisman was partly forgotten, and afterward the three sat listening in an enthralled fashion to a second installment of the soldiers' adventures in India. If the tale about the monkey's paw is not more truthful than those he has been telling us, said Herbert, as the door closed behind their guest, just in time for him to catch the last train, we shan't make much out of it. Did you give him anything for it, father? inquired Mrs. White, regarding her husband closely. A trifle, said he, coloring slightly. He didn't want it, but I made him take it, and he pressed me again to throw it away. Likely, said Herbert, with pretended horror. Why, we're going to be rich, and famous, and happy. Wish to be an emperor, father, to begin with. Then you can't be henpecked. He darted round the table, pursued by the um, uh, maligned Mrs. White, with uh, armed with an anti mascar Massacre. Mr. White took the paw from his pocket and eyed it dubiously. I don't know what to wish for, and that is a fact, he said slowly. It seems to me I've got all I want. If only you'd cleared the house, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you? said Herbert, with his hand on his shoulder. Well, wish for 200 pounds then. That'll just do it. His father, smiling shamefacedly at his own credu uh, credulit credulity, credulity, held up the talisman as his son, with a solemn face somewhat marred at a wink at his mother, sat it down at the piano and struck a few impressive chords. I wish for 200 pounds. said the old man distinctly. A fine crash from the piano greeted the words, interrupted by a shuddering cry from the old man. His wife and son ran toward him. It moved, he cried, with a glance of disgust at the object as it lay on the floor. As I wished, it twisted in my hand like a snake. Well, I don't see the money said his son as he picked it up and placed it on the table. And I bet I never shall. It must have been your fancy, father, said his wife, regarding him anxiously. He shook his head. Never mind, though. There's no harm done. But it gave me a shock all the same. They sat down by the fire again while the two men finished their pipes. Outside, the wind was higher than ever and the old man started nervously at the sound of a door banging upstairs. A silence unusual and depressing settled upon all three, which lasted until the old couple rose to retire for the night. I expect you'll find the cash tied up in a big bag in the middle of your bed, said Herbert, as he bade them good night, and something horrible squatting up on the top of your wardrobe watching you as you pocket your ill-gotten gains. He sat alone in the darkness, gazing at the dying fire, and seeing faces in it. The last face was so horrible and so simian that he gazed at it in amazement. It got so vivid that, with an uneasy little laugh, he felt on the table for a glass containing a little water to throw over it. His hand grasped at the monkey's paw, and with a little shiver, he wiped his hand on his coat and went up to bed.
in the brightness of the wintry sun next morning. As it streamed over the breakfast table, he laughed at, this fe at his fears. There was an air of Prozac wholesomeness around the room which it had lacked the on the previous night, and the dirty, shriveled little paw was pitched on the sideboard with a carelessness which betokened no great belief in his virtues. I suppose all old soldiers are the same, said Mrs. White. The idea of our listening to such nonsense. How could wishes be granted in these days? And if they could, how could two hundred pounds hurt you, father? Might drop in on his head from the sky, said the frivolous Herbert. Morris said the things happened so naturally, said his father, that you might, if you so wished, attribute it to coincidence. Well, don't break into the money before I come back, said Herbert as he rose from the table. I'm afraid it'll turn you into a mean, avicious man, and we shall have to disown you. His mother laughed, and following him to the door, watched him down the road, and returning to the breakfast table, was very happy at the expense of her husband's credulity, all of which did not prevent her from scurrying to the door at the postman's knock, nor prevent her from referring somewhat, sh referring somewhat shortly to retired sergeant majors of biblious habits when she found that the post brought a tailor's bill. Herbert will have some more of his funny remarks, I expect, when he comes home, she said, as they sat at dinner. I dare say, said Mr. White, pouring himself out some beer. But for all that, the thing moved in my hand. That I'll swear to. You thought it did, said the old lady soothingly. I say it did, replied the other. There was no thought about it. I had just... What's the matter? His wife made no reply. She was watching the mysterious movements of a man outside, who, peering in an undecided fashion at the house, appeared to be trying to make up his mind to enter. In mental connection with the 200 pounds, she noticed that the stranger was well-dressed, and wore a silk hat of glossy new newness. Three times he paused at the gate, and then walked on again. The fourth time, he stood with his hand upon it and then with a sudden resolution flung it open and walked up the path. Mrs. White at the same time placed her hands behind her, and hurriedly unfastening the strings of her apron, put that useful article of apparel beneath the cushion of her chair. She brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room. He gazed at her furtively, uh, and listened in a preoccupied fashion as the old lady apologized for the appearance of the room and her husband's coat, a garment which he usually reserved for the garden. She then waited patiently, as her sex would permit, for him to broach his business. But he was at first strangely silent. <clears throat> I was asked to call, he said at last, and stood and picked a piece of cotton from his trousers. I come from Ma and Megan's. The old lady started. Is anything the matter? She asked breathlessly. Has anything happened to Herbert? What is it? What is it? Her husband interposed. There, there, mother, he said hastily. Sit down and don't jump to conclusions. You've not brought bad news, I'm sure, sir. And he eyed the other wise wistfully. I'm sorry, began the visitor. Is he hurt? demanded the mother wildly. The visitor bowed in assent. Badly hurt, he said quietly, but he is not in any pain. Oh, thank God, said the old woman, clasping her hands. Thank God for that. Thank- She broke off suddenly as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned upon her, and she saw the awful confirmation of her fears in the other's perverted face. She caught her breath and turned her slower and turning to her slower witted husband, laid her trembling old hand upon his. There was a long silence. He was caught in the machinery. Oh, he was caught in the machinery, said the visitor at length in a low voice. Caught in the machinery, repeated Mr. White in a dazed fashion. Yes. 
He sat staring blankly out at the window and taking his wife's hand between his own, pressed it as he had been wont to do in their old courting days nearly 40 years before. He was the only one left to us, he said, turning gently to the visitor. It is hard. The other coughed and rising, walked slowly to the window. The firm wished me to convey their sincere sympathy with you in your great loss, he said without looking around. I beg that you will understand I am only their servant and merely obeying orders. There was no reply. The old, woman fa the old woman's face was white, her eyes staring and her breath inaudible. On the husband's face was a look such as his friend, Sergeant, might have carried in his, into his first action. I was to say that Ma and Megan's disclaim all responsibility, continued the other. They admit no liability at all, but in consideration of your son's services, they do wish to present you with a certain sum as compensation. Mr. Wife dropped his wife's hand, and rising to his feet, gazed with a look of horror at his visitor. His dry lips shaped the words, How much? Two hundred pounds, was the answer. Unconscious of his wife's shriek, the old man smiled faintly, put out his hands like a sightless man, and dropped a senseless heap to the floor. In the huge new cemetery, some two miles distant, the old people buried the de their dead and came back to a house steeped in shadow and silence. It was all over so quickly that, that, they, that at first they could hardly realize it, and remained in a state of expectation, as though of as though if something else to, of something else to happen, something else which was to lighten this load too heavy for old hearts to bear. But the days passed, and expectation gave place to resignation, the hopeless resignation of the old, sometimes miscalled, apathy. Sometimes they hardly exchanged a word, for now they had nothing to talk about, and their days were long to weariness. It was about a week after that the old man, waking suddenly in the night, stretched out his hand and found himself alone. The room was in darkness, and the sound of subdued weeping came from the window. He raised himself in bed and listened. Come back he said tenderly. You will be cold. It is colder for my son, said the old woman, and wept afresh. The sound of her sobs died away on his ears. The bed was warm, and his eyes heavy with sleep. He dozed fitfully, and then slept until a sudden wild cry from his wife awoke him with a start. The paw, she cried wildly. The monkey's paw! He started up in alarm. Where? Where is it? What's the matter? She came stumbling across the room toward him. I want it, she said quietly. You've not destroyed it? It's in the parlor, on the bracket, he replied, marveling. Why? She cried and laughed together and bending over, kissed his cheek. <laughs> I only just thought of it, she said hysterically. Why didn't I think of it before? Why didn't you think of it? Think of what? He questioned. The other two wishes, she replied rapidly. We've only had one. Was that not enough? He demanded fiercely. No, she cried triumphantly. We'll have one more. Go down and get it quickly, and wish our boy to be alive again. The man sat up in bed and flung the bedclothes from his quaking limbs. Good God, you are mad, he cried, aghast. Get it, she panted. Get it quickly, and wish, oh, my boy, my boy. Her husband struck a match and lit the candle. Get back to bed, he said unsteadily. You don't know what you're saying. We had the first wish granted, said the old woman feverishly. 
Why not the second? A coincidence, stammered the old man. Go and get it and wish, cried his wife, quivering with excitement. The old man turned and regarded her, and his voice shook. He has been dead ten days, and besides he, I would not tell you else, but I could only recognize him by his clothing. If he was too terrible for you to see then, how now? Bring him back, cried the old woman, and dragged him toward the door. Do you think I fear the child I have nursed? He went down in the darkness and felt his way to the parlor, then to the mantelpiece. The talisman was in its place, and a horrible fear that the unspoken wish might bring his mutilated son before him ere he could escape from the room seized upon him and he caught his breath as he found that he had lost the direction of the door, his cold brow cold with sweat. He felt his way round the table, and groped along the wall until he found himself in the small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand. Even his wife's face seemed to change as he entered the room. It was white and expectant, and to his fears seemed to have an unnatural look upon it. He was afraid of her. Wish, she cried in a strong voice. It is foolish and wicked, he said in a strong voice. Wish, repeated his wife. He raised his hand. I wish my son alive again. The talisman fell to the floor, and he regarded it fearfully. Then he sank trembling into a chair as the old woman with burning eyes, walked to the window and raised the blind. He sat until he was chilled with the cold, glancing occasionally at the figure of the old woman peering through the window. The candle end, which had burned below the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls, until, with a flicker larger than the rest, it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed, and a minute or two afterward, the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke, but lay silently, listening to the ticking of the clock. A stair creaked, and a squeaky mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive, and after lying for some time, screwing up his courage, he took the box of matches, and striking one, went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs, the match went out. What's that? cried the old woman, and he paused to strike another. And at the same moment, a knock so quiet and stealthily as to be scarcely audible sounded on the front door. The matches fell from his hand and spilled in the passage. He stood motionless, his breath suspended until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room and closed the door behind him. A third knock sounded through the house. What's that? cried the old woman, starting up. A rat, said the old man in shaking tones. A rat! It passed me on the stairs. His wife sat up in bed listening. A loud knock resounded through the house. It's Herbert! she screamed. It's Herbert! She ran to the door, but her husband was before her, and catching her by the arm, held her tightly. What are you going to do? He whispered hoarsely. It's my boy. It's Herbert, she cried, struggling maniacally or mechanically. I forgot it was those two. It was two miles away. What are you holding me for? Let go. I must open the door. For God's sake, don't let it in, cried the old man, trembling. You're afraid of your own son, she cried, struggling. Let me go. I'm coming, Herbert. I'm coming. There was another knock, and another. The old woman, with a sudden wrench, broke free and ran from the room. 
Her husband followed to the landing and called after her appallingly as she hurried downstairs. He heard the chain rattle back, and the bottom bolt drawn slowly and stiffly from the socket. Then the old woman's voice, strained and panting, The bolt! she cried loudly. Come down! I, I can't reach it! But her husband was on his hands and knees, groping wildly on the floor in search of the paw. If he could only find it before the thing outside got in. A perfect uh, fusillade of knocks reverberated through the house. Then he heard the scraping of a chair as his wife put it down in the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back. And at the same moment, he found the monkey's paw and frantically breathed his third and last wish. The knocking ceased suddenly, although the echoes of it were still in the house. He heard the chair drawn back, and the door opened. A cold wind rushed up the staircase, and a long, loud wail of disappointment and misery from his wife gave him courage to run down to her side, and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp flickering opposite shone on a quiet, deserted road. And that is the end. A bit of an abrupt ending, to say the least. But it was a fascinating story, wasn't it, dear viewers? Okie dokie. Well, it seems we have a little bit of time left over. Let's see if I can find a fourth story. Or if anybody in chat has a story they would like me to read, you should read Sonic.exe. I do not believe that- is that one written? Is it? Ah, I see, I see. Very well, Shu. I will read Sonic EXE. <laughs> Very well. This one is apparently estimated reading time of 18 minutes, so I believe it will make for it'll make for a good time. <laughs> Would it really be Cerulean Skies if something silly didn't happen on one of these streams? At least we spent the first hour here being relatively serious. How is it 18 minutes? That's what the site tells me, although it might take me about that time given the way that I read. Very well, so it shall be done. Sonic.exe 
I am going to be do my absolute best to read this as seriously as possible. Call all your nerd friends, I guess. <laughs> Very well. Alright, let's do it. Sonic.exe Creepypasta Story I'm a total Sonic the Hedgehog fan, must like, much like anyone else. I like the newer games, but I don't mind playing the classics. I don't think I've ever played glitchy or hacked games before, though I don't think I want to play, it any, after, play any after the experience I had. It started on a nice summer afternoon. I was playing Sonic Unleashed. I liked how you get to explore the towns in it, until I noticed, out of my peripheral vision, that the mailman had arrived and put something in my mailbox as usual and left. I paused my game to go see what I got in the mail. The only thing in the mailbox was a CD case for computers and a note. I took it inside. I looked at the note first and realized it was from my dear friend Kyle. Let's just call him that. Whom I hadn't heard from in two weeks. I know that because I recognized his handwriting. Though what was weird is how it looked. It looked badly written and scratchy and somewhat difficult to read as if Kyle was having a hard time writing it down and did it in a hurry. This is what he wrote. Tom, I can't take it anymore. I had to get rid of this thing somehow before it was too late, and I was hoping you'd do it for me. I can't do it. He's after me. If you don't destroy the CD, he'll come after you too, and he's too fast for me. Please, Tom, destroy this godforsaken disc before he comes after you too. It's too late for me. Destroy the disc and you'll destroy him, but do it quick, otherwise he'll catch you. Don't even play the game, it's just what he wants. Just destroy it. Please. Kyle. Well, that was certainly weird. Even though Kyle is my best friend, and I haven't seen him in two weeks, I didn't do what he asked me. I didn't think that a simple gaming disc would do anything bad to him. After all, it's just a game, right? Boy, was I wrong about that. Anyway, I looked at the disc, and it looked like any ordinary computer CD-R disc. Except it had a, bl had a black marker on it written Sonic EXE, and it was much unlike Kyle's handwriting. Meaning that he must have gotten it from somewhere else, like a pawn shop or eBay. When I saw Sonic on the writing of the CD, I was actually excited and wanted to play it since I am a big Sonic fan. I went up to my room and turned on my computer, put the disc in and installed the game. When the title screen popped up, I noticed that it was the first Sonic game. I was like, awesome! Because like I said earlier, I like the classics. The first thing I noticed that was out of place was when I pressed start. There was a split second when I saw the title image turn into something much different. Something that I now consider horrifying before cutting to black. I remember what the image looked like in that split second before the game cut to black. The sky had darkened. The title emblem was rusted and ruined. The Sega 1991 was now Sega 666, and the water had turned red, like blood, except it looked hyper-realistic. But the freakiest thing that was in the split was that was in the split second frame was Sonic. His eyes were pitch black and bleeding with two glowing red dots staring right at me. And his smile had stretched wider to the edge of his face. I was rather disturbed about the image when I saw it, though I figured that it was just a glitch and forgot about it. After it cut to black, it stayed like that for about 10 seconds or so. And then another weird thing happened. The save file select from, so from Song of the Hedgehog 3 popped up. And I was like, what the hell? What's this doing in the first Sonic game? Anyway, then I noticed something off. The background was a dark cloudy sky of the bad Stardust Speedway level from Sonic CD. And there was only three save files. The music was that creepy caverns of winter music from Earthbound. Only it was extended and seemed to have been in reverse. And the image for the save file where you see a preview of the level you're on is just red static for all three of the files. What freaked me out more was the character select. It showed only Tails, Knuckles, and to my surprise, Dr. Robotnik. Now I was sure that something was up. I mean, 
How can you play as Robotnik in a classic Sonic game for crying out loud? That's when I realized this wasn't a glitchy game. It was a hacked game. Yeah, it definitely looked hacked. It was really creepy, but as a smart gamer, I wasn't scared. Or at least I tried not to be. I told myself that it was just a hacked game, and there's nothing wrong with that. Anyways, shaking off the creeped out feeling I, uh, that I picked up... Shaking off the creeped out feeling, I picked up file 1 and chose Tails, and when I selected and got started, I heard a the, uh, and chose Tails, and when I selected and got started, the game froze for about 5 seconds, and I heard a creepy pixelated laugh that sounded an awful like, lot like that Kefka guy from Final Fantasy before cutting to black. The screen stayed black for about 10 seconds or more, then it showed the typical level title thing, except the simplistic shapes were all different shades of red, and the text showed only Hill Act 1. The screen faded in, and the level title vanished, revealing Tails in the Green Hill Zone from Sonic 1. The music was different, though. It sounded like a peaceful melody in reverse. Anyway, I started playing and had Tails start running like you would in any of the classic Sonic games. What was odd was that Tails was running along the level. As Tails was running along the level, there was nothing but a flat ground and a few trees for five minutes. Then, when the peaceful music started to lower down into slow, deep tones very slowly, er, that, that was when the peaceful music started to lower down into slow, deep tones very slowly as I kept going. I suddenly saw something and I stopped to see what it was. It was one of the small animals lying dead on the ground, bleeding. That was when the music started to slow down. Tails had a shocked and saddened look on his face that I never saw him have before, so I had to move along, and he kept that worried look on his face. As he kept moving, I saw more dead animals as Tails moved past them, looking more and more worried as the music lowers and he moves past more dead animals. I was shocked to see how they all died. They all looked like somebody killed them in a rather gruesome in rather gruesome ways. A squirrel was hanged on a tree with what appeared to be his entrails hanging out. A bunny had all four of his limbs torn off, and a duck had his eyes gouged out and his throat slit. I felt sick to my stomach when I saw this massacre, and apparently so did Tails. After a few more seconds, there was no more animals, and the music seemed to have stopped. I still kept Tails to continue. After a minute passed and the music stopped, Tails was running up a hill, and he stopped. It wasn't until I saw why. Sonic was there on the other side of the screen with his back against Tails, and his eyes closed. Tails looked happy to see Sonic, but then his smile faltered, obviously noticing that Sonic wasn't responding to him. If not acting as if he, as if he was totally oblivious of Tails' presence. Tails walked slowly towards Sonic, and I noticed that I wasn't even moving my keyboard to make him move, so this had to have been a cutscene. Suddenly, I began to have a growing feel, feeling of dread as Tails walked closer to Sonic to get his attention. I felt that Tails was in danger and something bad was going to happen. I heard faint static growing louder and louder as Tails was but inches away from Sonic and stopped and stuck his hand out to touch him. That foreboding feeling in my gut was growing stronger, and I felt the urge to tell Tails to get away from Sonic as the static grew louder. Suddenly, in a split second, I saw Sonic's eyes open, and they were black, with those red glowing dots, just like that title image. Though there wasn't a smile, when that, when that happened, the screen turned black, and the static sound was off. It stayed black for about 7 seconds, and then white text appeared forming a message saying, Hello, do you want to play with me? At that point, I was creeped out. I didn't want to continue with the game, but my curiosity got the better of me when I was taken to a different level with the level title now saying, Hide and Seek. This time, I was in the Angel Island level from Sonic 3, and it looked like everything was on fire. 
Tails looked as though he was scared out of his wit this, wits this time. He actually looked at me and made me made frantic gestures to me as if he wanted to get out of the area he was in as fast as possible. I was starting to get freaked out by this. I mean, Tails was actually breaking the fourth wall, trying to tell me to get him out of there. So, I pressed down on the arrow key as hard as I could and made him run as fast as he could. A pixelated version of that creepy theme when you meet Shadow at the Ark as Robotnik from SA2 was playing as I made Tails trek through the desolate forest, trying to help him escape from whatever he was trying to run from. Suddenly, I heard that creepy laugh again. That awful Kefka laugh. Right after 10 seconds had passed, as I helped Tails run through the forest, and then I started seeing flashes of Sonic popping everywhere on the screen, again with those black and red eyes. The music changed that suspenseful drowning jingle as I see Sonic behind Tails slowly gaining up on him. Flying! Sonic wasn't running, he was actually flying! The flying pose his sprite was making looked very similar to Metal Sonic's flying pose in Sonic CD, except it was just Sonic, and he had the black and red eyes again. Only this time, he had the most deranged looking grin on his face. He looked as though he was enjoying the torment he was giving the poor little fox as he gained up on him. Suddenly, when Tails tripped, another cutscene, the music stopped and Sonic vanished. Tails laid there and started crying for 15 seconds. The scene was rather upsetting to watch, and I've kind of teared up myself. But then Sonic appeared right in front of Tails, and Tails looked up in horror. Blood started to come down those blackened eyes of Sonic's as a grin slowly grew from his face as he looked down at the horrified fox. I could do nothing but watch. Just in a split second, Sonic lunged at Tails right before the screen went black. There was a loud screeching noise that only lasted 5 seconds. The text returned only this time it said, You're too slow. Want to try again? And then that god awful laugh came with it. I was so shocked by what had happened. Did Sonic murder Tails? No, he couldn't have. He and Tails was, are supposed to be best friends, right? Why did Sonic do that to him? I shook the shock off as I went, as I was, as I was brought back to the character select. The save file that Tails was had, that had Tails was different. Tails was no longer in the box itself, but in the TV screen itself which was flickering with that red static. Tails' ex expression scared me. His eyes were black and bleeding. His orange fur had gone back, and he had an expression of anguish on his face. Trying to ignore it, I picked Knuckles next. The laugh came again, and the screen cut to black again, and stayed there for another 10 seconds. This time, the level said, You can't run! I was really freaked out by now. I couldn't really tell if this was a glitch or a hack, or some kind of sick twisted joke, or anything really. But despite my fear of what happened next, I kept playing. The next level looked much different. It had the ground of the scrap brain zone. The sky background looked m like the main menu. It had the dark reddish cloudy sky, but it was the music that creeped me out the most. It sounded like the Gigas theme right out right after you beat Pokey in Earthbound. I also noticed that Knuckles looked afraid just like Tails did. Though not as much. Or rather, he looked a little unnerved. He broke the fourth wall just like Tails, and looked as if he wasn't sure about what's going on. But I made him move anyway. He ran down the straight pathway in this dark level and did as the screen and as he did the screen started to flicker red static a couple of times and that maddening laugh came on then after a few seconds of running i noticed several blood stains on the metallic ground i felt a growing sense of fear again thinking something horrible is going to happen to knuckles he looked nauseated walking down this blood stained road but i still kept him going Suddenly, as Knuckles ran, Sonic appeared right in front of him with those black and red eyes, and then red static appeared again. When the static vanished, showing nothing but black screen with text, when when the static vanished, showing nothing but black screen with text saying, 
Found you. I was now scared. Sonic found Knuckles already? What's going on? Anyway, Red Static came, in, came again, and then I was back to the level. It's Knuckles. I was back to the level. But Knuckles looked like he was panicking, and Sonic was nowhere to be found. And this time, that high-pitched squealing from Silent Hill's one final boss was playing. Was this some kind of boss battle with Sonic? I hope to god it wasn't, honestly. Suddenly, Sonic appeared right behind Knuckles in what appeared to be pixelated black smoke. I made Knuckles turn and then punch Sonic, but Sonic vanished in black pixelated smoke before I could even land a hit. That terrible laugh went off again. Then Sonic appeared behind Knuckles again, and then I made him punch again, and Sonic vanished again, laughing. Knuckles was panicking even more, and even I felt like I was going crazy. Sonic was practically playing with us. He was playing a sick, twisted little mind game with me and Knuckles. Another cutscene played as Knuckles... <laughs> as Knuckled fell to his knees and clutched his head sobbing. I felt his agony. Sonic was actually driving us both crazy. And then, in a split second, Sonic lunged at Knuckles and the screen went black for another distorted screeching noise that lasted for at least three seconds. Another text message appeared. So many souls to play with. So little time. Wouldn't you agree? What the hell? Just, what is going on? I started to think Sonic was actually trying to talk to me through the game, but I was too scared to think about that. I was brought back to the main menu, and this time the second file box had Knuckles on the TV screen. His red fur had darkened to a reddish gray. His dreadlocks were dripping with blood, and his eyes were black and bleeding too. And he had a look of sadness on his face. When he began to think that those are the actual characters trapped in those TV screens on the save files. But I couldn't believe it. I just didn't want to believe it. So, I shut off the game and took a break. I took a nap. Wish I hadn't, because I then began to have the most disturbing nightmare. I was in a pitch black darkness. So I was under the light given off by a lamp that hung high above my head. I could hear the cries of Knuckles and Tails nearby. They were saying stuff like, Help us! And, Why did you give us to him? And, Run away! Before he gets you too! Their cries died out, as I then heard Sonic laugh. His laugh. It sounded a lot like the distorted Kefka laugh. You're a lot of fun to play with, kid. Just like your friend Kyle though he didn't last long. I was scared, and looking around for the source of the voice. Won't be long now until you join him and my all my other friends. I saw him walking toward me, flickering in and out several directions. You can't run, kid. You're in my world now, just like the others. When he grabbed me and I saw his bleeding, black and red-eyed greening face, I woke up with a fright. After a couple of hours, I decided to continue playing the game. I don't know why, but I had to know. I had to figure out why this was happening. So I turned on the computer, turned on the game, and selected Robotnik next. I still thought that was wacky, playing as Robotnik. But anyway, the level title appeared again, and this time it said, dot 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 which I found really freaky. This time I was in some kind of hallway. It didn't really look like it was from any of the classic Sonic games, though it has the pixelated style. The floor was shiny and checkered, the walls a dark grayish purple with animated candle lights and a few dark blood stains here and there, and there was a dark red curtain hanging above on the top part of the screen. Every 12 seconds or so that red, that red curtain sways very slowly. But whenever you're playing the game, you can barely see it move. The music was oddly pleasant. A piano playing a rather sad yet peaceful song. But I knew better. This was the song that played in Hill Act 1. Only, it wasn't in reverse. Robotnik didn't look entirely nervous like Tails and Knuckles did. But he did have a suspicious look on his face as if he was just a bit paranoid. He did a little animation. When I had just left him standing, he turns his head to the left, and then to the right, at least twice, and then shrugs at me. 
as if he has no idea where he was or what was going on. Even though I was scared out of my mind about what was going to happen. I had Robotnik continue onward. He did his usual running animation. You know, when you've beaten him at the end of a classic Sonic game and you chase him. As we continued through the hallway. Then I stop at a long flight of stairs leading downward. Now I was nervous. Even Robotnik seemed unsure of himself, though I pressed onward. As I led Robotnik down the stairs, I noticed that the walls have gotten darker and more reddish. The red torches are now an eerie blue. Then we landed onto another hallway. This one was longer than the last one, or at least it felt like it. And then we headed down another flight of stairs down. This one was much longer, it took at least one full minute. And then I heard that horrid Kefka laugh again, and then the music slowly faded until it was quiet. As it did, the walls turned more dark red, and the torches were a black flame now. When Robotnik landed on the third hallway, I noticed how he, how he now looked really creeped out, though he tried to hide it. I couldn't blame him, I was scared too. Suddenly, Sonic popped right in front of Robotnik, the same way he did Knuckles and then Red Static. The Red Static lasted for about 15 seconds, and then it showed a most unpleasant image. The image showed a hyper-realistic of Sonic standing in the darkness, where you can only see his face, while his head and torso faded into black. And when I say hyper-realistic, I mean like he looks so real you could actually see the lines in his blue fur. As if you could actually feel the fur if you touched the screen. His face. Oh god. He had the most horrifying smile I had ever seen. And that's saying something considering I saw that image at the start of the game. His eyes are wide and black once again. Crying blood. Which also looked hyper realistic. And there were, there were two small glowing red dots in those black eyes staring right at me. As if staring into my mind. His grin was wide and demonic. It literally stretched to the sides of his face like a Cheshire cat. Except Sonic had fangs. Very sharp fangs. Much like the werehog's teeth except more vicious looking. Somewhat yellowish and from the look of it, he had stains of blood and small bits of flesh on his lips and fangs as if he ate some animal. I stared at that gruesome image for a good 30 seconds, never taking my eyes off of it. I felt as if he was actually looking at me, smiling at me. That face. It just took 10 seconds for it to etch itself into my brain for good. Then the screen flickered with red static again three times, and on the third time I heard the Kafka laugh, except this time it sounded distorted, demonic even. It went back to the image again, except this time there was the text again, though it was messed up, but it was pretty much one of the most horrifying things I looked at since I had this game. I. Am. God. It was then, it was when I read that message while looking at Sonic when it hit me. I realized it right there and then. This Sonic was a monster. A pure, evil, sadistic, all-powerful, nightmarish, demented monster. And all of his victims, including Tails, Knuckles, Robotnik, and possibly Kyle, are just his little toys. And the game is his very gateway into his chaotic, nightmarish world, and the very hell his victims are trapped in. Suddenly, in an actual split second, I screamed as Sonic lunged at the screen, screeching loudly with his mouth wide open to an unnatural length, revealing nothing but a literally spiraling abyss of pure darkness before the red static came again, this time much louder and distorted. So loud that it hurt my ears. I yelled and grabbed my ears as the red static screeched for a good 7 seconds. Then it stopped and showed nothing but a black screen. As I sat there staring at the black screen, one last text came up. Ready for round 2, Tom? The Kefka laugh, now sounding more clear as if Sonic was right behind me, played again, three times as I looked at that text in shock and confusion. Then I got booted back to the main menu, and this time the third save file had a TV image of Robotnik in the same tormented state as Tails and Knuckles. Robotnik's skin turned a dull gray, his mustache drooped and had blackened. His glasses broke and blood is coming from them, and he had a mere dead-like expression on his face. 
I looked at Tails, Knuckles, and Robotnik, and I cried a bit. I pitied them for the agony they're going through. They were forever trapped within the game, forever tormented by that horrid hedgehog, and always will be. Then the computer shut itself off, and I couldn't turn it back on for no matter, uh, no matter what I did. I sat there for maybe 25 seconds, horrified by what had just happened. Sonic is the very embodiment of evil. He tortures people who play his game in more ways than one, and then when he gets bored he drags you into the game, literally drags you to hell, where he can play with you always, as his toy. I can't get the game out of my computer, I think it's stuck in there, but at least I managed to turn it back on now. After I sat there for 25 seconds, I heard a voice right behind me, like a whimper. Try to keep this interesting for me, Tom. I turned around to see where the voice came from, and what I saw made me scream. Sitting on my bed, staring at me, was a sonic plushie smiling with bloodstains under, it, uh, under its eyes. The End I think that's probably the first time I've ever actually read the fanfiction. I've only ever played the game, and I recall back in like middle school, high school, like stumbling upon that on like new grounds, or like there was a site called Mario and Sonic Games.com that also I think had it too, and it's just a compilation of Mario and Sonic fan uh, flash games. And admittedly, at that time, it was pretty terrifying. It scared me good then, for sure. But, yeah, I was actually pleasantly surprised with the quality of, quality of that. <laughs> I'm glad it was an entertaining experience. However, dear viewers and dear listeners, this is the end of story time with Golden. Now, the night is not done. If you would like to join us here on Cerulean Skies again and not and you're new here, well, Cerulean Skies is just a hub for collective games and media, where you can hang out with like-minded people and discuss and talk about like-minded things together. Additionally, if you're looking to get into content creation, then we have the one-stop shop for you to get your journey started, whether that be streaming, recording videos, and or writing articles. Come join along and learn how to make content with an audience that has very much the same mind as you. Or just hang out with people. We have all of that available, so follow us on Twitter, join the Discord, and check out the website. Additionally, if you liked what I did here and would like to see more of me, please follow me on Twitter, Twitch, and or YouTube as well. I do a variety of different things and use my voice in a variety of different ways, and you'll find me here as well at least once or twice a week. Now, the night is still not done, for after this... Sphere Karibon slash Shu is going to be playing some games for us as well to end the Halloween night as well. So join us here in a little bit within 15 to 20 minutes or so, and we'll have our final event for the Cerulean Skies Halloween Extravaganza Night. And of course, as always, thank you all so much for listening here on Cerulean Skies, and we shall see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>